I'm deeply honored to be talking with Dr. Shimani Jane today. She is the founder and CEO of the Consciousness and Health Initiative, a nonprofit collaborator accelerator that connects scientists, health practitioners, educators, and artists to help lead humanity to heal ourselves. Dr. Jane also serves as adjunct faculty at UC San Diego, where she's an active member of the UC San Diego Center for Integrative Medicine's Research Committee. Her best-selling book, Healing Ourselves, Biofield Science and the Future of Health via Sounds True Publication is available at booksellers nationwide, worldwide, and I am so excited to dive deep into biofield science with Dr. Shamani Jane. So thank you so much for joining us today. You bet, Catherine. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Can we just get started with a basic foundation for our listeners and viewers today? How do you explain the biofield? So the biofield really is a newer term for an age old understanding. That's the first part of it. And Catherine, I was chatting with one of my colleagues, Dr. Richard Hammerschlag, who actually serves as our research director for the Consciousness and Healing Initiative. And he said, Shamini, you know, we keep talking about the biofield as a thing, but maybe we ought to talk about the biofield as a perspective. And the reason he says that is because when we examine the biofield, it's really a plural. It's biofields. In short, we can define it as fields of energy and information that guide our health. Some of these things we can directly measure, like EEGs, for example. We measure electromagnetic energy coming off of the head that relates to our brain function. Same with the EKG, not controversial. And then there are the subtle aspects as well, right? Um, the subtle aspects, of course, have to do with age-old understandings like chi, prana, how they flow in the body, and how they relate to health. We can go even further. We can study the biofield of a cell and learn about cell communication and communication that's happening in the body and in, very, in ways that we can test and measure, right? We can look at the biofields between people, and that's some of the work that I have been doing for many years, looking at healing practices, right? Biofield healing practice with subtle energy. And our friends are studying the biofield of the earth, the electromagnetic vibrations and emanations from the earth, the electromagnetic fields generated from the earth and what that means for human earth connection and for human health. So what Richard is saying is we might wanna consider biofield as really a perspective because no matter how you look at the biofield, what we're learning about is that it's, it's a way of understanding the world that opens us up to the deep healing interconnection between all things. So, you know, that's that's basically it in a nutshell. You know, it, I like this idea of the biofield as a perspective, but some of these things are very measurable. Some of them are not. And so, you know, this can include things that people have called the aura in past, but not just the aura. It's also things that are very directly measurable. Absolutely. And I love that you bring it back to that interconnection because, I mean, personally, that's what got me into biofield science and medicine and quantum biology is just that sense of safety and belonging that I have and my patients find reconnecting with the world around us and with that biofield, right? And I know that sometimes you explain the biofield in terms of consciousness. Can we go there for a minute? Absolutely. So here we'll look at the ancient perspectives on consciousness and what we call the biofield. And I'll really sort of rest in the East Indian traditions, Vedic, Tantric, Jan, and others um, to sort of explain this relationship. And again, it's just a perspective, right? But I think one that many of your viewers will definitely resonate with, and that is from Western science, we study consciousness in many different ways. I almost call it little c consciousness. It's like the little b biofield, you know, studying biofields of cells and things like that. So people in cognitive psychology, cognitive neuroscience might explore consciousness from the frame of attention and awareness and, you know, integrating the senses and things like that. And they call that consciousness. But the, the ancient spiritual traditions, not just the East Indian, but across the world have talked about consciousness as a formless oneness. This is what we might call big C consciousness, right? This is consciousness that is ever present. Um, some describe it as all knowing, ever blissful, which is truly our, our true nature, 
right? It's our true nature. Um, we are that unbounded consciousness. We can consider ourselves a part of that unbounded consciousness or just know that the nature of our being, whether we call it our soul, spirit, or whatever, is that unbounded and actually formless in nature. So then the question becomes, well, how does the formless come into form? And here's where we can explore what I often like to call the big B biofield. So in the tantric traditions, we call formless oneness Shiva. It's, it's, you know, and we see the depiction of the Shiva God, but it's basically a name for the formless oneness that is there. And some will, you know, you describe, it's often described as the divine masculine, right? The big B biofield then relating to big C consciousness. So if big C consciousness is Shiva, then big B biofield in these traditions is Shakti, right? And Shakti is the manifest power that gives life to everything in the universe that takes the formless and puts it into form. So why is this important? If we look at those ancient traditions, what we begin to understand is from that type of cosmology, that understanding of how the world came about, right? The formless coming into form. Then we recognize that we are not separate from anything that we see. We are not separate from the trees. We are not separate from the ocean. We're not separate from the bees. We're not separate from anything. We are all living expressions of consciousness and form, and we have certain energetic qualities. And as human beings, you know, we, we dive into practices in uh, medical systems like Ayurveda, Chinese medicine, and whatever, we understand that we are consciousness in form expressed through certain elemental natures, for example, that have been described as water, air, earth, fire, space, right, in the, in the um, Ayurvedic traditions. Mm -hmm. So we're all this like, each of us is this unique expression of all of the elements expressing themselves in every moment through our thoughts, words, and deeds, through everything that we do, say, and we are. Um, but the key of it, I think, in, in speaking to interconnection is this. I can look at someone who is very different from me, right? I can look at that person and I can say, oh, you and I express our energy differently, right? We are made up of different conglomerations of energy depending on what has happened in our life even potentially past lives if we believe in that and yet we're all part of that same fabric of consciousness so when i sit with you even if you think very differently than me can i sit in that kind of presence where i can resonate with the deeper vibration of who you are beyond just what you're saying even you know, and the conditioning that has caused you to express yourself in the way that you are and the conditioning that causes me to express myself in the way that I am. So, you know, ultimately, if we're talking about moving to unity consciousness, then I think that, you know, exploring the biofield in this way um, from the spiritual perspective is deeply important. Oh, absolutely. I couldn't, I got goosebumps because that's where real change happens, right? It's when we can recognize ourselves and the universal in others and what a change that would make throughout our globe if we were all doing that, right? What, what an amazing thing. Um, this is beautiful, Shamani. I'd love to talk a little bit about how this work is being brought out through your nonprofit. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you're doing there? You bet. So I come to this work, you know, I came to this work initially really as a scientist, and I, I still do um, very much. And it was through that scientific journey that we birthed the Consciousness and Healing Initiative. Because all of these spiritual understandings are beautiful, but what happens when we put this into practice? What happens when we actually examine what healers are doing, when we hear about these extraordinary healing experiences that people have, and we say, well, if this stuff is really true, then shouldn't it be in the hospital settings and shouldn't it be in the clinic settings? So, and I talk about this in my book, Catherine, you know, the first Reiki experience that I had in my 20s, it was like the light bulb just went off in my mind. And I was like, oh, I can feel this vibration. I can feel its connection with past thoughts and behaviors and patterns in my life. And if I acknowledge sort of my agency in this situation, you know, the minute I did that, I felt the energy move, really. It was quite profound. And so I had this sort of profound, uncomfortable, honestly, experience in the very first Reiki session where I was feeling all this pain and stagnation. And then watching the resolution of that as, you know, as the, the nature of that problem was coming to mind. And I thought, wow, 
this is really powerful medicine. Like this could be really powerful for patients. And I wonder if anyone is studying it. So that set me off on my scientific journey. And I'll just, you know, I, I share more in the book, but fast forward to conducting my own randomized placebo controlled trials on energy healing for things like cancer related fatigue, all that data is published. And I describe it in the book. In a nutshell, we found that hands-on healing approaches for fatigue breast cancer survivors, and these are women anywhere from six months to 10 years post-treatment that are so debilitated by fatigue, which is the number one complaint among cancer patients and survivors, um, when they receive just eight sessions of energy healing from a trained practitioner, they drop down to fatigue levels of what you would expect for someone walking down the street. And not only that, but their cortisol rhythms normalized. And that's a really important biomarker. I get more into it in the book. But um, we didn't find that for the people that got the, quote, mock healing, who were just touched lightly. So, you know, what's happening in a mock healing condition People are being touched by a loving presence. You know, there's a relationship that's obviously built. We measured all kinds of things in that study. We measured relationship because a relationship is a huge driver of healing responses. Yeah. Belief, how much you believe that the treatment is helping, whether you think you're getting healing or you're not getting healing. They don't know, right? They're just being touched in the same way. All the sessions were done in silence. And it was interesting because those who were in the mock group, as you might expect, just by coming in and resting twice a week, being touched twice a week, feeling connected, they did show some response. They showed some reduction in fatigue that was significant, not as much as the healing group, the ones that received the healing. But their cortisol levels didn't change at all. And the weightless control group as well. It was only the people that were receiving the actual energy healing where we saw these physiological changes. And I was flabbergasted, honestly, right? I'm, I was just really curious scientist wanting to understand what this is, if it's all placebo, what is it? And then I came across other researchers who were doing some really groundbreaking work. And I recognized that all of us were struggling because we didn't have community. Most of the researchers, tenured professors at major universities didn't have anyone to talk to about those results. Sometimes they would have trouble publishing the data. And these are all people that get millions of dollars of NIH funding for their usual work. So because of that, I said, well, we need a community to support each other and ideally raise funds to do more research in biofield science. So we started the Consciousness and Healing Initiative um, for that reason. And since then, what we realized is while we started with a community to support scientists, we started sharing what we knew with others. And all of a sudden, we had a really rich and beautiful community building with the healing practitioners who were saying, wow, this is fantastic. This is the data I've literally been looking for all my life to help explain what it is I'm doing. Thank you so much. So we started really growing our initiative to understand that everyone, an artist, an educator, an entrepreneur, you know, a technologist who's working in measuring the biofield, a scientist who's doing the research and the healing practitioner and the spiritual practitioners all have a facet of wisdom to bring to this. So we're really a community and now we offer a lot of education. We have free webinars every first Friday of the month, which anyone can join. You just go to webinarsonhealing.com. We have some of the leading lights, you know, very well-known people who grace, um, grace our, their presence with us, so like Greg Braden and Bruce Lipton and Deepak Chopra and Donna Eden and so many who have come and, you know, been part of these beautiful healing dialogues, um, which are totally free. We have people joining from all over the world. It's really cool, actually, because they all, a lot of them join live. Um, and we're also offering this amazing science of healing course, which is to our mission, sharing both the science and the practice of healing. And here we really explore things like consciousness and the biofield, diving deep into placebo and what it means from a consciousness based perspective. What are mind body spirit practices actually saying when we look at the data and what does the ancient wisdom say about those practices and then we dive really deeply into biofield science the clinical studies. The cell studies biofield devices right and explore the future of healthcare and we have amazing guest faculty that are part of this, you know the names I mentioned before but also sue mortar, um, who is a wonderful teacher and a healing practitioner. Um, Eileen McCusick, who is just a dynamite sound healer you know, many, many different people, many um, academic researchers as well. So it's a really cool community and they're all kind of showing up for this course, which is fantastic. Oh, that is absolutely wonderful. That sounds fantastic. And I'm such a huge 
fan of what you're doing. It's so important. And creating community is really, really important. Um, I know I've spoken a lot on this conference about Gerald Pollack's work and how he's having trouble getting funded. I mean, there's so many amazing researchers out there that are having trouble getting funding because the NIH funds only certain type of research, right? Um, there is definitely a mainstream narrative that can crowd out this important work um, with, by lack of funding and just a louder voice, right? Um, that's, that's what the mainstream narrative really has. Can, can we talk a little bit about how even your TED talk uh, got censored and, and sort of the story behind that and how it plays into that uh, being crowded out by that mainstream financially based narrative? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are still in a situation where mainstream science and medicine really hangs its hat on materialism, right? The idea that we're only our physical bodies and you know that's all that matters. And I like to remind people, my home research area is psychoneuroimmunology which is a terribly long word that nobody likes to say. I always joke, if you can say psychoneuroimmunology really fast seven times, you get your degree because nobody can do that. So we say P&I for short, but what P&I has taught us, and it's only been around for about 60 years, maybe not even that, I think 50. 50 years ago, if I said my emotions affect my physiology and I'm noticing that there's a certain um, kind of psychological predisposition for certain patient groups and that depression could even exacerbate illness, I would have been laughed at. Mm -hmm. People didn't even believe that the brain and the immune system were connected 50 years ago. I mean, mm -hmm. if that tells you anything. So not only have we been steeped in this idea of materialism that we're only our physical bodies, but that reigning doctrine that the body is a machine, that different parts don't talk to each other. Okay, so now we are evolving. We understand that that's not true. But when you talk about things like the energetic body, that's still difficult to measure, right? Because everything is about measurement and mechanism. Mm -hmm. Then mainstream science and medicine, you know, really can't deal with that. So what happened with my TED talk, I was my recent one, I, I gave one about eight years ago, that one was not censored, because I really alluded to energy, but I didn't dive deep into the biofield in that talk, I talked more about placebo and which apparently is also a red flag talk for TED, but that's another story. Um, anyway, somehow I didn't get censored for that one, but I was invited to give this talk for TEDx Berkeley and, you know, they were very excited. They knew about the biofield science work. They wanted to know more about it. And um, I decided to talk about that actually in, in the framework of what it means for understanding our interconnection. So the title of the talk was, We're Wired to Heal Each Other, The Science of Interconnection. Mm -hmm. And I began with some of the neuroscience of interconnection, which is just amazing coming out of research from my fellow scientists in psychoneuroimmunology from UCLA and others. But then I moved into biofield science, like how, what, because again, when we study the healing practitioners and we we're seeing these effects of healing practitioners on things like in animal models of cancer, reducing the spread of cancer in the body in these very tightly controlled studies that are being conducted at places like MD Anderson Cancer Center, right? And I brought all this up in the TEDx talk. I, I reviewed a lot of data. Um, what does that mean for our healing interconnection, right? So I was very excited about the talk. And then I'll tell you kind of the whole story because I think people should know about it. So midway through the curators of TEDx Berkeley began getting nervous because they were given these guidelines that TED gives everyone for TEDx talks. And they said, be a little wary of these red flag areas. We're, we're not saying that you shouldn't do anything in these areas, but you need to be really careful if you do anything. And we kind of discourage you guys from doing talks in these areas. What are the areas? Anything having to do with placebo, anything having to do with healing and beware, they literally say, beware of anyone who is trying to draw parallels between science and spirituality. So they hand me these guidelines and I'm like, well, are you sure you want me to give this talk? Because I'm kind of touching on all those areas. And they said, yes, we absolutely want you to give the talk. You're the data person. We want you to share the data. We want people to know how real this is, that this isn't woo. Oh, but by the way, they're saying that you shouldn't use the word Reiki or Chi in your talk. So I'll just let that sit in for a minute. You know, you can talk about this, but don't use the word Reiki and don't use the word Chi. So I just sort of sat there, you know, for a moment and they started looking nervous because I just didn't all out agree. And I said, look, you know what this talk is about. You know, in the talk, I also talk about why is it so hard for us to believe this work? Mm 
right? I, I actually get to that in the talk. And I said, what you're asking me to do completely goes against what the talk is about. And you know that. So I can't censor myself like that. I mean, I don't know what's going to come out of my mouth. You know, I understand we have a script and everything, but whatever happens is going to happen. Um, so we, you know, made sure that the talk was very data heavy. Ted asks for references, which I was happy to provide about 30 peer reviewed published references, not just my work at all, but many, many different studies. Um, and, you know, I make a use of talking about meta analyses and systematic reviews, which bring together the data from many studies, right? Mm -hmm. Really wanted to give it a strong evidence based talk. Then I found that they released it without telling me with a flag on it and changed the title of the talk as well. Wow. Which I've never heard of. I mean, how can you even do that? How do you change the title of somebody's talk without telling them? How do you release it with a flag without telling them, right? So I have been in dialogue with them about this. The community has been pretty bummed about it. Um, there's some beautiful, the talk is out, you can watch it. And I encourage people to watch it and share. We created, my team created a URL. So if you go to tinyurl.com forward slash wired to heal, mm. you'll find the talk. Or you can just Google my name and Ted talk and you'll find it. Um, there are many comments on this, you know, issue because Ted isn't a, only flagging my talk. Some of the people watching here can be aware that Rupert Sheldrake's talk has been banned. Mm -hmm. Many people talking about consciousness have been either banned or flagged. And I did a little research on this. And it turns out that Ted has actually flagged talks on breathing, flagged talks on nutrition, like flagged talks on a lot of areas. So. I'm still struggling with them. I have friends that want me to file a lawsuit. I'm not going to do that. But there are a few issues. One is they've changed the title without permission. They are saying that the talk is based on my personal research, which is simply not true. Mm -hmm. And the talk very much reflects that it's not just my personal research. And um, when I asked them, you know, I need you to help me understand everything I shared was evidence based. Here was, and, and this is relevant because we need to understand where we're going in science and medicine, where we need to go. We're evolving. We're understanding the interconnections. How do we bring in this beautiful understanding of the power of our consciousness for healing? Like really bring it in. How do we do that? Mm -hmm. One of the key areas, and this is why NIH doesn't fund the work. They want to know the quote mechanism because they're still looking at things like healing like a drug, right? And they want us to do those kinds of studies. So their, their issue with mechanism kind of plagues all of the mainstream, um, you know, funding outlets, scientific sharing outlets and whatever, because they're really thinking about this in this very narrow way. So apparently the bone that they had to pick with me was that I shared this data from MD Anderson that I mentioned, mm -hmm. where we're seeing these effects all the way to, you know, cancer metastasis or spread of cancer in the body that healing can actually reduce the spread of cancer down to inflammatory cytokine signaling down to protein kinase signaling in the body. So we're drilling down on this on the cellular signaling pathways that are related to cancer spread and noticing that those changes are happening across those pathways for and I said in these studies it's not a drug or even a device that's having these effects. It's simply a person channeling the currents of compassion to another living system to generate a healing response. Mm -hmm. Well, apparently they took that as me describing that that's the mechanism and that's what they took issue with. This is one of the reasons they gave that they flagged the talk because I said that. <laughs> and, and so I've just been sitting with this, you know, it's a really interesting thing because from their perspective, they're thinking I'm hand-waving about mechanism because they just wanna know what that mechanism is. Is mm -hmm. it an EMF? Is it an electromagnetic field? If we block that electromagnetic field, will we block the effect? Because that's the paradigm they're stuck in. Mm -hmm. And the idea that the quote mechanism could be love, mm -hmm. right? Could yeah. be love. And look, we don't just see this in biofield work. We're, we see this when we look at the data for social support, psychotherapy, so-called placebo, you know, the power of connection. That's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. And we can put all these fancy terms and labels on all of it, but it seems to be so threatening for people that something so, um, you know, ever present and yet immeasurable, like love is actually what's driving healing effects. That's considered radical. And I find that wild, <laughs> to be honest. I think it's wild that we have such problems with it.
it, it is absolutely wild. And, you know, when you look at the lineage of hi history of medicine and science, you see this time and time again. Scientists, researchers, great thinkers, free thinkers are ridiculed and ostracized. And then when society has the tech and the means to actually measure it, then their ideas come back and they're validated. And, you know, both you and I uh, talk a lot about how this quantum biological information that's coming out in heaps and droves in the research nowadays is connected back to that ancient wisdom we've always known about we're just now being able to quantify it and measure it and look for mechanisms right so it doesn't surprise me at all that ted is obsessed with mechanisms and you know whether those mechanisms fall in line with the red flag um yeah, yeah absolutely really and in, in my book i get into i have a whole chapter called what's the mechanism right and and as you could probably guess i think the term mechanism is unguided because it, it misguided because it implies a singularity that there's only one pathway and we know the body doesn't work that way even cytokines in our body which are immune transmitters in the body i'm sure you're familiar um you know are pleiotropic that is they have different effects right they and depending on the environment and a cytokine could actually be inflammatory or anti-inflammatory there's data to support that so it's all context it's environment um and the idea that there has to be a singular mechanism now i get into this more in my book but let's just suppose for a minute if we look at all of the data and the, i go over like there's i don't know at least over 700 peer-reviewed published references in my book on the data and also a nice section on healing practice, like just putting it into practice, because ultimately we have to do that or there's no point to anything. <laughs> um, we can look at effects as placebo. We can look at them as potentially electromagnetic field effects. We could look at it from the quantum perspective, right? But we're almost because scientists are taught to use Occam's razor, right? You're familiar with that. So the idea for those who aren't familiar with Occam's razor, we're trained to think we got to look for the most parsimonious solution. And it makes sense, right? Because you can't be creating crazy theories out of nowhere when you don't need to. You don't want to overcomplicate things. The issue is Occam's razor is, you know, it's sort of it's it's not very systems oriented, because if we look at the data, and the and what we know about the data right now, then we can say, yeah, some effects are attributable to attributable to what we call placebo. Some can be measured by EMF because there have been some studies showing that if you block EMF, you can block effects of energy healers on cellular mechanisms. There's some of that data exists, right? But not all of it supports that, right? And we have we don't have direct, as far as I know, data on you know the quantum explanations for energy healing per se, but we certainly have enough data in quantum biology to suggest that that is a real possibility. But why do we feel like we have to hang our hat on just one? Because most likely it's a layered effect, right? We're multidimensional beings, we are multi have multidimensional systems. Of course, touch has an effect. Of course, presence has an effect. Of course, our field has an effect, aspects that we can measure. And of course, we're connected with a larger field that is non-local in nature. Why can't all these things be simultaneously true? So if we're going to explore mechanism, I think we got to explore it from a more expansive perspective. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's one of the things I like about quantum physics is that, you know, just inherently as a principle, matter can take more than one path, right? Like we can explore multiple paths. And the beauty of that is just gaining more wisdom um, that that one path really excludes all these things. Um, Absolutely, absolutely. This is so exciting to be talking about. And I know that you have uh, some recent research out about quantum healing and sound. Can you take us through uh, what you're finding with that? Yeah, you bet. So, you know, sound is really what brought me to the work um, in general, just my own experiences with sound. And as everyone knows, I mean, the pandemic was really rough for most people. And there were a lot of folks who were really isolated and alone, especially during the shutdowns. Yeah. So what we did was we actually explored whether a sound healing approach delivered virtually, so it's a distant healing approach really, but people are still connecting in via Zoom, 
whether that could have effects on reducing clinical levels of anxiety in people. And so we did this very quick feasibility study. So it was uncontrolled. We're now raising funds for the randomized controlled trial. We're well on our way. And if there are any donors here who want to learn more, please let me know because we still have a little bit of money to raise for this study, for the randomized controlled trial. What we found in the initial study to just see is this feasible? Like, can we actually do this kind of sound healing approach? It's based on the work of Eileen McCusick, who wrote a fabulous book called Tuning the Human Biofield. She's trained practitioners all across the world, thousands of practitioners. So we used about six different practitioners for this, um, looking at different people all over the United States who were suffering from clinical levels of generalized anxiety. So if they walked into a doctor's office and they took the GAD-7, which was our screening instrument, they would have met criteria for generalized anxiety disorder at that time. And we gave them three sessions of biofield tuning of the sound healing approach at a distance over Zoom. So they met over Zoom, they turned the video off, and you know the person would just receive the sound healing approach. And there was some dialogue that happened between them at that time. And um, anyone who's interested should look into biofield tuning to learn more about the approach. But essentially, they're using tuning forks to tune into the field. And the practitioners say that they can not only feel the field, but hear the field with the fork in terms of where there's a stagnation. And they have a whole method and, you know, kind of a map of when I feel and hear a perturbation in a certain area of the field, what does it mean? What is it related to? Right. And that becomes important when we query the people later and they're like, how did they know that this happened to me at age four? Well, the, according to the practitioners, it's all in the field, right? They can sense it. They get that information. So what happened after three sessions was that we saw these profound decreases in um, anxiety. You know, we used the state trade anxiety inventory kind of gold standard approach for measuring anxiety in the clinic. And we found state and trait anxiety decreased, negative affect decreased. We used the PANIS for that positive and negative affect scale, positive affect increased. But it was really the negativity, the negative attributions of themselves and others that changed. We interviewed them. We did qualitative interviews, too, and kind of just asked them what came up. A lot of really cool things came up. So both of those papers are under review right now in peer-reviewed um, scientific journals. And, I'll, you know, I can send links to them when they come out if, if your community is interested. Absolutely. There were a few cool things, though, besides just the fact that their anxiety decreased on this questionnaire. We actually had them call in every week and just sort of speak into the phone um, to a prompt that was, how was your day? And we did that every week, just kind of get a sense of what was their day like? What was their week like? Right. How's your week been? And what we noticed when we analyzed the language using standard methods from our colleague at uh, the University of Arizona, Matthias Mel, who's done lots of this work, is that their use of negative affect language or their use of negative emotion language actually decreased over time as well. So not only did their, you know, it was really resonant with their anxiety decreasing, the use of negative emotion language decreased from a completely different way of measuring it. And then when we asked them what was it like, not only did a few of them say they figured out things that I never told them, you know, and I don't know how they got that information. You get that a lot, right, from healers who get information. But they said their relationship with their anxiety changed. And I think this is really important for us to consider because we often don't think about the healing practices as contemplative practices. And everyone knows, you know, there's been a lot of great research on mindfulness and the idea of cultivating an observer as part of the practice. So the more we practice certain forms of meditation, most of them, honestly, the more we cultivate the observer state, the ability to be present in the moment without judgment. And what happened for these folks, and they weren't doing a formal meditation practice, but after receiving these healings and kind of getting the stuff cleared out of the field, was that they were able to recognize the anxiety or the anxious thoughts, but they didn't feel like that was them. They were in touch with a deeper part of themselves, right, that was able to witness the flow of anxiety happening, but they weren't connected to it in that way. It wasn't part of their identity. They weren't identifying with it in the same way. And they noticed their relationships change too, right? Because they're rooted in a deeper sense of themselves. So really beautiful. And I think it just shares just the tip of the iceberg of what these healing practices can do for us, you know, when we're in a state of suffering. And right now, you know, humanity's in a great state of suffering. So this is why we do the work, you know, this is why we do the work at the Consciousness and Healing Initiative, why we gather community in this way, because you know, I'm a, I'm a clinical psychologist, so I was trained in cognitive behavioral therapy. I pushed for mindfulness-based internships at that time. It was a while ago, you know, it was when it was still new. 
Um, so we did some of that third wave work, but and I see the value of those approaches. I'm not discounting those approaches, but when we look at the bioenergetic, the biofield, the spiritual healing practices, we see that they're adding a whole new dimension to the work that is so important right now, especially for mental health, where ultimately we need to connect back with the source mm -hmm. for our healing. And these practices can do that. You know, so anyway, I'll stop there. There's so much more to say about energy psychology practices and the, you know, the, the work that they're doing in that realm, you know, maybe some people are familiar with it, some great data coming out from that and great work that's coming out from that community. Absolutely amazing. I love that you guys utilized it virtually, right? Because lockdowns and the pandemic and just our increasing dependence on modern technology really brings us to this virtual kind of relationship at times, you know? And so that that entrainment of health was caused virtually is just amazing to me. You know, I saw a research study where they um, measured two people playing a game together, um, virtually separated by miles and their brain waves entrained. Um, right. Yes, it's absolutely, just absolutely amazing the, role that psychoneuroimmunology has both from our own thoughts but the input of in training with other um, mental you know waves brain waves co-regulating it's just absolutely fascinating can you tease it apart just a little bit more for our listeners today well you know speaking of entrainment this is a great point um I talk about this in the book. Many people may be familiar with the early studies done um, with the Institute of Noetic Sciences called D, they called it D mills, right? It's distant mental um, interaction of living systems, something like that. I don't know if I spelled it right, but essentially they were looking at distant intention. And they have done many, many care, and it's not just the ions that's done this, the Institute of Noetic Sciences, but other researchers as well. And similar to what you were saying, Catherine, they would have people separated in space at different locations, um, and they would have these very carefully um, set up kind of cognitive psychology types of experiments. And at times, there would be a person that would try to tune into the other person that's, you know, in a different location. And the other person didn't necessarily know when they were getting tuned into. But when that would happen, their physiology would shift. And only when the person's tuning into them, right? So there's an entrainment that's happening. A few years ago, our initiative actually took a delegation of scientists and healing practitioners to India, where we went to several ashrams to study meditation in the traditional setting and understand it better. So we were really pleased and privileged and honored to be in these ashrams. And one of the things that we found when we were in Pondicherry at the Sri Aurobindo ashram there, when we were studying advanced meditators at this time, was that when people came together to practice meditation, and particularly when they were focusing on the interior experience, so here they weren't necessarily focusing on trying to connect, there was no volition of trying to connect, they were all just meditating together and actually all going inward together we saw evidence for coherence of brain waves between people. So EEG coherence between people, that kind of entrainment. And as you mentioned, I mean, we've seen entrainment um, in many different models, even people who were learning a skill together, who were separated, you know, in space and learning in general seems to really help the entrainment, makes you think of what's going on in the classrooms, right? If the teachers are successful, how that's, you know, there's sort of a group brain that's really forming in those conditions. Um, a lot more that we could explore with entrainment and you know and then there's entanglement which is a whole other thing to explore <laughs> those are some wonderful explorations and that's what i love about your work is that it really looks at the interconnections and that's what I'm all about, and I know my viewers and followers are also um, really excited to be returning to that relationship because I think so many of us are desperately seeking that belonging and sense of safety. And as a doctor who has suffered from anxiety, um, that that relationship just right there that returning to that self that sense of belonging and safety in the world around us is really life-changing um 
And, and I think, it, I think the book for me that did it, I like 20, 25 years ago was the positive, the power of positive thinking by the Dalai Lama. And it's talking about all these things you're talking about, right? The entrainment of brain waves with meditation. It's just phenomenal. It's absolutely phenomenal. And I'm so grateful for researchers like yourself that are continuing with this path, regardless of red flags and <laughs> censorship and, and everything that, that you're dealing with. This is absolutely wonderful. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, I'll just share a personal reflection, which I've only shared with a few friends, which is, you know, not knowing what was going to happen after I after I finished the talk. When I walked off that TEDx stage, I felt like a circle of completion. It was almost like a, a weight had been lifted off of my shoulders, a self-imposed weight of like carrying the torch. Um, and I don't feel that way. I'm not even, you know, I was a, I was a little angry. I'm not going to lie. I was a little angry when I first found out about the flag. And um, now it's sort of like, okay, we're just going to move on. And, and, and if anything, I'm more and more convinced that the way that we're going to bring this work forward is really through our presence more than convincing. There's no need to convince anyone, right? There's yeah. just a need to continue to carry our own light, to sit in the knowing of the nature of our belonging, the nature of our safety, because we are always connected. That's the truth. And that's the beauty of what all of this research shows us, right? So when we can just rest in that, rejoice in it even, right? Everyone is, is seeking peace right now. So I feel that the more we can just be that beacon of peace, again, with people who may think very differently from us, it's okay. You don't have to believe in the biofield. I'm not a proselytizer, <laughs> you know, it's not, it's okay. Um, I do think that these practices, if they're evidence-based need to be in the hospital setting in the clinic, and I will continue to do everything I can to bring that, you know, into place. And it will happen, it happens with all holistic practices, there are just things you have to do. That's all fine, but I think as a community now, we have to just recognize the divide and conquer forces that continue to try to play games with us as a humanity and decide that we're not gonna play that game. We're not gonna fall into the duality. We're just gonna be the change, literally, right? Because that's how it's gonna happen. It's really that simple. So for me, honestly, these days, it's all about coming into practice. And I do a lot of teaching now, um, the different retreat centers and with my dear friend, Bruce Lipton, we do some programs together and, and with some other, you know, dear friends. And, and I really, I enjoy those the most because when we come into collective resonance, like we are with the summit, the summit is very important, right? We're bringing us all together to sit with the realities of, of what we know and share it with others, but sharing it from our hearts, not from our heads. And that's all about just resonating the change. And, you know, I think we all know that, but it's just a reminder that ultimately the more we come into practice, that's what's going to really shift things. Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And, and that's such a beautiful place to kind of wrap this conversation up with that the collective does matter. And just embodying that and going forth is where we're at right now, um, not getting caught up in that divide absolutely beautiful uh dr jane thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today 